I am here with Dr. Daniel Strange, author of Plugged In, Connecting Your Faith with What You Watch, Read and Play. Thanks for joining us here at Speak Life. Great to be here, Glenn. Thank you. The foreword by Tim Keller, you must have been very, very thrilled with this. He said, there really is nothing else like this book. And I suppose, you know, as an author, you write a book because you feel that there's a, a gap in the market. But, but what, what is it that has been kind of influencing you as you try to think about connecting Christian faith with the culture around us? What, what books have influenced you? Yeah, well, I wanted to do something that was kind of uh, try to be as practical and accessible as possible. So I think there's lots of stuff written about the relationship between Christ and culture, but does it get down to the nitty gritty everyday kind of stuff that we do? A lot of it's kind of quite esoteric. And it was saying, I mean, this is a course that um, I've been teaching at Oak Hill for 10 years, which is saying, um, you know, uh, the, the, the assessment of which is do a cultural analysis of anything that you want to. And I've had the weird, the wonderful o o o over the years yes. and to give some kind of method as, as to how we might do that to show that everything that human beings do communicates their um, their worldview, how they want to make a home for themselves. And that has religious significance. So um, I suppose I, I, you say I'm in the kind of um, Dutch reformed tradition of understanding who we are as human beings, the fact that God's revealed himself, we've rebelled against that, and um, what that means for the interaction between the gospel and our culture. Um, and so the, the, the book is trying to explore. I, th I, th I would hope that the nothing else like this book is something about the, the practicality of saying to everyone, every Christian, hey, you can do this, you need to, you can take the, the glasses that the book gives you and say, yeah, I can understand something of culture in a way that's going to um, impact my evangelism, but as much impact my discipleship. What does it mean to follow the way? What does it mean to follow Christ in a Christian way? Um, so that's that's what's behind the book, really. Yeah, you, you say that uh, there are kind of four reasons why we want to engage with culture. You, for, for a start, we are surrounded by culture. You cannot escape culture. You, you, you could be Amish, yeah. but that's a culture of itself. Um, yes. We care about our own discipleship. We want to honor Christ in how we live and help others to do likewise. Uh, we care about telling others about Jesus so that they become disciples. So I guess that's, that's an evangelistic thrust there. Uh, and then you've got this interesting phrase, as his ambassadors and vice regents, we care about Jesus' lordship over everything. Uh, why, why does that make us want to plug into culture? Yeah, because I, so I think this goes back to the idea of a concept called the cultural mandate back in Genesis, where uh, we've been created in the image of God. We're not God, but we're created in the image of God. And so I think the, the role of having dominion to fill and subdue the earth and um, it's kind of recognizing that the, the idea of an image or an, an icon in the, a, the ancient Near East was that you had an icon that you kind of, which staked the claim for the God that you believed in. So as Christians, we are staking a claim for Christ's lordship in all the world, uh, the God who has uh, created us. And so uh, that's why I think there's so many um, descriptions in the Bible or in the New Testament, especially about taking every thought captive for Christ. We are disciples of him. So when we become Christians, we kind of uh, take up that, uh, that calling again to um, fill and subdue. Now, of course, uh, we, we we that can only be done and that's where the kind of the cultural mandate and the great commission kind of wonderfully interplay together because to take up that claim again to take up that dominion people need to be converted they need to turn from idols to the living god and so that's why i, I mean the book doesn't really explore this much but i think it's a given that the whole kind of um i don't know evangelism and discipleship or you know those big things that we make issues for ourselves in which comes first they, they all go together people need to be converted when they've been converted then they need to fill and subdue the earth under christ's lordship mm -hmm. you, you say on page 88 you know why aren't we telling better stories with all the same realism imagination subtlety complexity and beauty that the culture is um and uh, you, you don't spend a lot of time in, in terms of creating culture in this yeah. book, but but what why why is it that you think that you know the, the kind of waters that we swim in reformed evangelical <laughs> circles uh, we don't have a great reputation for for being patrons of the arts even though the church historically has been the greatest patron of the arts that the world has ever yeah. seen where have we gone wrong i think we've there's been a kind of a um a diminished doctrine of creation hmm. um uh, and almost a sole focus on on the new creation but I, I mean for me salvation is about um uh is, is, is grace restoring and perfecting creation 
Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the kind of it's both the going back and the going forwards. And I'm not. I, I wonder whether we've we've had. Um, uh, yeah, so a, a kind of diminishing of a doctrine of creation, and then I think um, an anthropology and understanding of who we are as as, as human beings. Um, now, again, the the phrase is, is often used, and I, you know, we can use it, throw it about that you know we kind of have an anthropology that sees us as being brains on sticks. Mm. And I don't, and in no way do I want to uh, diminish the intellect or the life of the mind, or uh, you know, that that's so Im important. But we're more than simply the intellect, and this idea of a holistic anthropology that says the heart is at the center of the human person and that includes the intellect and the emotion and the will and the imagination mm -hmm. especially and that's where um, I think and I, I wonder whether in, in intellectually the circles that we swim in <laughs> um, there maybe there has been a uh, an over rationalization of what apologetics and discipleship looks like now I mean I, I want to be careful there because I, I, I still think you know, I believe, as, as I know you do, we believe in apologetics, we believe in persuasion, we believe in argument. Mm. And yet the way that we can put those arguments are as, as expansive as the, the human heart. Um, you know, giving a reason for the hope that we have, and I, I, I do make this point in the book, giving reasons is not simply a dry intellectual, it's about relationship, it's about, it's about um, engaging people in all of their faculties, which I know that you know, you're passionate about in terms of um, uh, song and um, uh, poetry and you know, all of those wonderful things. And that's where I wonder whether we just haven't engaged, we, we've been unimaginative or less than imaginative. Yeah, yeah. So partly it's our anthropology, we're brains on sticks, we're, we're homo sapiens instead of homo adorans, which you make a case yeah. for in the book. You know, we yeah. are men who love, um, even before we are the wise men. Um, and so, yeah, partly it's our anthropology. And, and perhaps partly it's kind of this, this reactive, where we are kind of against culture. Um, we, we simply want to confront culture. Um, that's that's kind of our, our, our knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but you, you yeah. make a, a yeah. case in the book that you want to confront and connect with culture. Yes. Sort of what, yeah. that, what that means. Yeah, and yeah, I think, um, well, just on the other point, so we've made a kind of a, an anthropological point. There's, in theologians, we also talk about a kind of an eschatological point, as in, mm. I, do, I do think um, salvation is being delivered. It's been delivered from the wrath to come. It's been delivered from hell. But salvation is not simply a get out of hell free card, mm. as in, we we fought, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and we follow the way is not simply an entry point or a destination. We are to follow the way, and that means um, uh, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean if if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has begun. Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the new creation, and we see what that means now um, in so many amazing ways. And um, I think one of the things that's that's struck me, and I'm still trying to work it out, is um, uh, Jesus says, if, if, if anyone would follow me, they need to take up their cross. And the, the Christian life is a sacrificial cross-shaped cross life. But then Jesus in a few chapters later says, um, you know, you, uh, you'll receive homes and mothers and fathers now yeah. and eternal life. And what does, what does that mean? And my worry is that we've had um, an, un, an already under-realized eschatology uh, now, of course, I, d I don't believe that this is now the new heaven and the new earth. I mean, I'd be worried if it was. Um, but the inbreaking now and what that means for our cultural endeavours now and what that means for the Christian life now. Yeah. So that's why the, the confronting and, and connecting comes in, because I think if we just take that view that we are simply confronting, but we are to connect because there is continuity. There's always continuity. And I'm, this is why I try to stress theologically in the book. I mean, I talk a lot about idolatry. The great thing about idolatry is that idolatry is parasitic. It's always taking a good thing and making it into a God thing. And so that, you know, whether you say, you know, the devil has no, no new stories or whatever, uh, even, even the most, what we think as godless culture will always have a, a, um, a, a root in something that is good and creational. And, you know, it's difficult to explain because how do you understand this conception of suppressed truth? And what does suppressed truth mean? Mm -hmm. But that's what he, precisely what it means. So whether it's in, we see in Acts 17 or in 1 Corinthians 1 that I talk about in the book, it's always saying that in, whenever we are um, engaging in, in culture, there will always be both affirmation and denunciation at the same time. And it's trying to get that kind of 
how do you do both of those things at, at the same time? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, how you bring those two passages in particular together is, is fascinating. So you, you begin your chapter on confronting and connecting. Um, uh, well, you, you talk about some First Corinthians 1 and, and um, that whole, the, the wisdom of the cross that sort of is, is a no to the, the Jews who demand power and the, the Greeks who demand wisdom. Um, but he also says yes later because he is the wisdom of God and he is the power of God. So yes. there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of a no and a yes. And yes. then he for us to sort of Acts 17. Um, and he seems to be saying, it depends on how you translate it. He says, you know, you men of Athens, you're very superstitious, religious, whatever, you know, whatever that is. But he certainly is happy quoting their poets uh, and then redeeming that and, and preaching the gospel, even if he quotes whoever he quotes, Aratus and whoever else he quotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So but I guess maybe, maybe, maybe is that the, the pattern though? It's a kind of a no and a yes. It's a cross and a resurrection, a law and a yes. gospel. Is it yeah, that? And, and, and I think some of us, because of our own personality, our own upbringing, our own culture, Christian culture with which we inhabit, some of us instinctively go to the no first or the yes first. And then we have to kind of do, the, <laughs> we do it. I think there is a kind of a, um, we, out, we, we probably have a default that either kind of confronts or connects most naturally what I think we try need to try to do is to try and make, make us make sure that we're doing both at the same time mm -hmm. and I certainly don't want to give the impression you know the great thing about Act 17 if you're worried that some of this stuff is a bit kind of you know oh it's too aff affirmatory or kind of you know too kind of a tough feelies Paul starts that starts Act 17 by having this paroxysm over idolatry so he's really disturbed by it and at the end he calls people to repentance if you have those two book in, bookends and they're site kind of there yeah. then whatever happens in the middle however contextual he is however much he's kind of engaging in the culture those bookends make sure that we are still calling people to turn from idolatry and repent yeah but yeah. but but in the middle there's this incredible contextual engagement of looking at people's objects of worship um uh, uh quoting from from their poets uh um but uh, so it is that that kind of both and and certainly you know um in the one corinthians one passage it is saying uh, as you said it's saying christ is power and christ is wisdom but in in exactly the opposite way that the world thinks and that's why this phrase that a kind of this missiologist Hendrik Kramer uses that the gospel is both that is subversive fulfillment is both subversion and fulfillment at the same time mm. and in some ways that's um deep enough and complex enough to think I'm going to spend my whole life trying to work out what that means and all the nuances and sophistication that that means in a way that both says no and yes yeah, yeah. Can we can we earth this in, in like an example how, of, of subversive fulfillment saying no and yes, um, yeah. saying, saying no to, to the culture in the incarnation in which it wants to present its object of worship to us, but then yeah. yes to the, the deeper yeah. desire behind that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've, so, got, I've got an idea of that yeah. on my head, but what, you, you, you go with an option that you've, uh, you, you've thought yeah, about. Yeah, well, that, this is all from, some of this is from my kind of uh, students who give great examples, but one example that I've been thinking about, which is surrounds this whole area of, of superstition, superstition. So we're told that we live in a very kind of disenchanted world, but we know that on the ground, superstition is all over the place. So the example that, that was given was um, someone who works in, in an office where you must never say the phones are quiet, because if you say the phones are quiet, it means the phones are going to get busy and you'll have a busy shift. Right. So. And I saw that this was one example. And then we have a guy at Oak Hill who's a policeman who said, that's completely true. On the radio, you never say it's, you will say it's Q tonight. You never say the word quiet because if you say quiet, it will, there's a, some kind of malevolent force that's going to make, the, that make things really busy. And then you realize it's in, it's in an um, emergency, it's in hospitals. It's yeah. all over the place, yeah. this kind of quiet phenomenon. And it's the idea that there is some kind of force that makes things happen. Now, we do not, but now, of course, in, in other religions, the whole idea of spirits and jinn and evil eyes all over the place, but in our so-called kind of disenchanted world, it's pretty enchanted. People do live by this suspicion all the time. And we're going to be saying as, as Christians, we don't believe in malevolent, impersonal forces. We believe in a loving heavenly father. We, do, we don't believe that we're kind of just robots. We believe we're accountable. And yet we believe in a God who is sovereign. So what we're doing is kind of we're bringing rich Christian theology, which, you know, about sovereignty and human responsibility to the everyday lives of the people who, 
get really cross with their colleagues because they've said quiet. <laughs> yeah, right. I remember having a great conversation um, uh, with at Southgate, playing cricket um, for, for Southgate when I was studying at Oak Hill, uh, which is situated in, in North London in Southgate. And um, it was a conversation about all the different superstitions that every single batsman had. And, and yeah, everybody yeah. had something. You know, somebody had a red, red handkerchief in their pocket. Somebody always wore their jumper inside out because they once scored 100 when they had their you know, jumper inside out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always had to cross the rope backwards. Like when he, when he went out to bat, he always had to spin around. And, and it was just very interesting, like talking about the crossover between superstition and religious thinking and scrupulosity and idolatry. <laughs> yeah. And because I guess we all, we all want to control the world, control yeah. the universe yeah. through our own actions. And I guess yes. there's another yeah. thing to bring to bear because that's, that's the law, isn't it? So, you know, what can I do to secure my destiny? Actually, yeah. you idiot, with your, with your jumper inside out and your, yeah. your, you know, your yeah. red handkerchief, you're still gonna get bowled for a duck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, even at a kind of a corporate level, I remember reading, so the week of the Champions League final with Pochettino, Pochettino is famously suspicious and he has this, uh, or superstitious, he has this, um, he has in his, in his office, so this is a, a, you know, you think about the sports psychology, the business kind of technicality of a major Premier League team. You go into Pochettino's office and there's a bowl of lemons on his desk because he believes in this universal energy that if people come in with negative energy, the energy goes into the lemons. So he changes the lemons every four to five days. <laughs> When life and, gives you lemons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And people say and people say, Oh, we live in a disenchanted world. I mean yeah, it's yeah. no it's it is differently enchanted. And I think that's because we are not as human beings for for how, however much you have your Stephen Fry or Richard or Christopher Hitchens or Dawkins, people do not find it easy to live in a live in a world where they think there is nothing. And that however, you know, the secular is really haunted and I think, you know, that that taps into the rich anthropology that the bible tells us that you know we are we are religious yeah yeah when people stop believing in god they don't believe in nothing they believe in anything the gk chesterton line how would how would you kind of use that in evangelism let's let's say that you're in a conversation and somebody just says something and then says touch wood or whatever like like in what in what direction would you be seeking to nudge the conversation yeah you, so I, I think yeah go on because you could because you could say well, that's just ridiculous you don't really believe that do you um but how, how, how would you do it kind of sensitively and in a gospel shape yeah i think i would i would want to gently explore and again this is why i think a lot of our apologetics and evangelism has to be done in the context of relationship as, because especially as you reach those things those kinds of uh, commitments that people have the more you get to them the more cherished they are and the more people feel kind of they don't you know they find it hard to talk about them but you'd want to tease out what what's behind that and i Again, I think the whole thing you pointed to, Glenn, is this idea of control, people wanting to feel in control of, of their lives and not wanting to feel out of control. And that leads to all kinds of habits and addictions and all, all kinds of issues that, that people have. And I will be wanting to explore that and then, you know, try to wait for the opportunity or try to, you know, guide the conversation round to people asking me about, you know, what, who... What do I think about my own life? Do I think I'm I'm in control? Um, what do I believe is what do I believe that um, in terms of uh, is there a God or you know and trying to get again trying to get people then to get to uh, talk about Christ and I, and I do think um, that what I'm working on starting to work on I, I hinted it in the book what the one theologian I found really helpful is this guy called J.H. Babbing, who's a missiologist, who talks about human beings having these magnetic points, kind of the same kind of questions that keep coming up all the time about who we are as human beings, what's gone wrong. And what I'm trying to do is to show how Jesus Christ, Jesus is the answer to all of these things that human beings struggle with all the time, whether it's kind of sovereignty and responsibility, or the idea of connection or the need for deliverance. And it is trying to show how, you know, we, as Philip says, to the Ethiopian, or as, as Luke records, Philip saying to the Ethiopian, we, we offer Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ is big enough to kind of answer all of these human questions, that are these perennial questions. So in terms of conversation, you're always wanting to have, to get to the opportunity where you can say something of Christ and offer Christ. Brilliant. Let me, let me press you on a couple of other um, kind of cultural examples and we'll see how this, there might be a subversive yeah. fulfillment and the offer of yeah. Christ at the end of it. I'll give you a, a more trivial one and then a more serious one. The more, the more trivial one, is somebody, uh, Duncan Hollands on Twitter has asked, <laughs> get, get Dan to talk about park runs. Why, why has park run become so popular? And then I'll okay. ask you, 
the more serious one, um, Pete Jackson, uh, who you might know as well, uh, would love some direction on how do we, how do we talk about the, the issue of abortion in our culture? Um, is there any way of doing a subversive fulfillment? Actually, Jesus in his way gives you what you're most looking for in, with that example. So I, I, I prepped you. Um, I'll give you the, the, oh, the easier option first, park runs, <laughs> and, then, and then, then we can solve the whole pro-life issue. <laughs> yeah, okay, 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 the hors d'oeuvre part one. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Duncan Hollins, who's currently one of my, I'm, I'm his tutor, so he's a little bit naughty, he's got in there. <laughs> um, part one, I mean, I, mean, I do part, I think the interesting thing about part one is obviously there, there is something about um, uh, this um, fitness kind of epidemic in terms of healthy and looking after the body, which is, you know, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is it, if you look into the, the way that part one talks about itself, there is something more than simply, let's just go for a run. There is, people are talking about something holistic. The idea of community, you know, the stress is, when we've done the park run, we're gonna to go to the cafe and we're gonna spend time together. It definitely is a communal space for people to um, meet up. What's interesting is, it, park run is for everyone, but as I look around and look at the demographic, and again, I, I've got no stats to, to back this up, it does seem to be quite a, um, me, quite a middle class phenomenon, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of does it does it does it really have a social range that that you would want in comparing it to what, for example, the church should be? But I, I think there is something communal there, and um, as well as all the other things, I've, I've had a number of students doing essays on 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 park runs and it's quite it's quite a um it's becoming quite a mature phenomenon now um but yeah i, I would want to stress this idea of commun community and park runs seems to be important um yeah. that i'm part of something bigger yeah um yeah. does seem to be you know it's a, it's a version of any kind you know i go and watch west ham or you go to a, go to a music conference you know babbing talks about this um this idea of connection or totality we want to feel as if we're part of something bigger um, and that seems to be all the rage at the moment in terms of marches we can go on or petitions that we, that we can sign. Uh, that we can sign this idea that we're connected to something, um, mm. and I think that's right for kind of um, um, talking about in terms of what you know, what we are connected to, uh, what we could be connected to in terms of Jesus and His kingdom and what that means mm -hmm. um, for um, that. In terms of well, I mean, in terms of the um, in terms of the abortion issue. Mm. Yeah, I'm I mean, I mean, in terms of understanding what life and dignity and personhood, I mean, I mean, that's all going to be very, uh, right. very obvious right. um, kind of things. In, in that sense, it's, you know, you don't have to do that much of a subtle, subversive fulfillment. It is a, it's pretty, pretty direct. Mm -hmm. um, you, you help me though here. I mean, I'm trying to think of how, mm -hmm. how you might. So Pete Jackson, uh, so his particular question is, I'd love to hear him comment on some pro-life abortion issues, e.g. why he thinks there hasn't been more pro-life speaking in action from UK evangelicals compared, for example, with US. Um, yeah. That's one issue we can... We can you know. Yeah. But, but I, certainly in, in, in my speaking, yeah, it, it, you, you want to connect with that desire that Dr. Zeus says, a person's a person no matter how small. You agree with that, don't you? A person's a yeah. person no matter how small. Well, let's just take that on and, and kind of uh, and, and press into that issue. And, and just the idea of the oppression of the little guy by the powerful. You don't believe in that, yeah. do you? You don't believe in the, yeah. the oppression yeah. of the little, the exclusion of the, of the weak and the voiceless? No, we want to be yeah. the, the voiceless, do we not? And, and so that, that's, I, I guess, would be... Yeah. How, um, how, how much do you think, again, in, in terms of the kind of... Um, how much is the issue of control an issue there and how in, in those discussions i mean is that is that's what is that what's behind the kind of pro choice it is a it is a control issue again yeah. that we want to kind of engage with yeah with the will to power that's like completely above nature itself we're so committed to divorcing sex from marriage and sex from sex from pregnancy and pregnancy from children like <laughs> like those four things are like let's chop them all up before we chop up the babies we chop those four things <laughs> From, from one another and you have to intellectually like totally like and artificially kind of break those things apart um and at, at points it takes forceps and the ripping of limb from limb to do that um but yeah there, there is yeah. The, the, the imposition of the will over nature um in order to to create the sexual freedom that that you know we we long to have um whereas you know maybe yeah. 
to, okay, you, you, you know what true liberation is. It's swimming in the waters for which you were made. And, and maybe sex and marriage and pregnancy and babies actually, actually go together. <laughs> and maybe that's, that's yes. actually what builds a society and, and will help you to flourish. But I don't know. Yeah. I th I, and in terms of the bigger question about why we haven't done this, I think oh, some of it is, a, is, I think, a British thing about thinking that um, what can we do? It's too late. Right. Maybe, maybe we should have said something at the time. Maybe looking back, we should have said more. But what can we do now? Everyone's, you know, uh, we need to be moving, you know. Yes. Yeah, yes. I, I, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, and again, you, I mean, I, I wonder whether you're, with your kind of, um, your more Aussie sensibility, which is still there, I imagine, whether that's partly why you, you're great in speaking out about it more, because I think some of the, your, the classic Brits will think, what can we do, you know? Yeah. Don't cause, don't cause a fuss. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, 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 I think that there, there is something there, um, and that what, yeah, what we can't envisage what it might be like to go back to um, a situation before. And so, I, I think there's all kinds of cultural things as to why we've been quiet when other conservative evangelical groups across the world still want to be really going for this issue. Um, and I, again, I, I just think it, it, it is a massive issue and it's under our noses all the time and we're not doing anything about it. And we're not speaking out about it. And what are we going to do? Mm. Um, yeah. but, but then I think it's pra practically, it's a, again saying what we're not very good at. If, if, one, we don't sometimes have a vision of what it could be. And two, even if we had that vision, we've got no idea how we might get there. Right. <laughs> so the idea of incremental strategy steps and what that might mean in terms of cultural plausibility, um, in terms of persuasion. Mm. That's where I'm kind of that interesting in the whole um, sexuality issue. You know, there's, there's manifestos in the 70s and 80s written by um, kind of, um, uh, uh, yeah, what you might call kind of gay manifestos in terms of this is what we need to do to turn the culture around. This is how we're going to do it. You can read it. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. we're... We're, we're not having those same kinds of discussions. Like, where, where are the conservative evangelical futurists? Where are the, where are the strategists thinking, this is how we kind of start to turn things around? Um, and there's all kinds of issues there. And I think there's a short-termism, there's a pragmatic, pragmatism. You're depressing me, man. I don't want to be depressed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, not that, there, not, that we need, not that we need a no. 70 point plan before we open our mouths. No, but, yeah, no. that, it would be nice, but... Um, but some, some, some kind of joined up thinking. And, and again, a, a toolkit to be able to help individual Christians to say, yeah, we can say something about that. We can start to, start to think about these things. We, can't, we can start to speak up. Um, so I, I think that there is a... There's a peculiar shape to that issue in the UK, which I which I do think is different in the in the states. Now, I do think there are aspects of the debate in the states or the polarisation of it that are helpful. But um, so I was doing a I was doing a paper um, at a conference in the states a few years ago, and someone came up to me and said, um, "Oh, you seem to be advocating the cultural wars that we've been trying to get away from." And I said, "I wish we could be more involved in the cultural wars here." Huh. Um, right. then, then I think then I think what, we what have mean, been. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, I think in, sometimes within the states, there's a worry that there's been too much of a kind of an, an us and them polarization, or there's been it's been too stark. Um, and I think we need to recognise more that we're in a battle, more that there were there were different ideologies going on here, than that the public square is, a, as one writer says, is a battlefield of the gods, and people are going to fight, fight for their fight for their own gods, and just that that spiritual reality that we realise in our public discourse. That there are there are huge different ways of viewing the world that are kind of combating e each other, and yes, we need to be civil, and civility is very important. But we can't get can't get away from these are antithetically different ways of understanding the world and different gods that we worship, and it is a battleground. And I, sometimes I think in a speaking the truth in love or with great with um, with grace and respect, we we need to recognise that we're in a battle, and it is a battle, yeah, um, yeah, and that. Yeah. And, and how do we equip the troops for the battle? Yeah.
which is it's always ironic isn't it that in the in the states where there is the ideological separation of church and state, and yet you know religion and politics yes. like this over here you know the queen is the governor of the church of england we've got bishops in the house of lords for goodness sakes um and and yet not even christians are thinking politically or thinking christianly about politics um yeah and so we're, yeah. we're much more likely to yeah. say, i'm just a gospel person and therefore i have yeah. nothing to say about any yeah. of these issues and some of those issues but, but, but it's little things. There was a, um, one very famous Christian kind of guy who's been involved in um, writing about church and politics. He's a guy called Stanley Hauerwas. Mm. So he, he's famously coming from a more kind of um, radical Reformation tradition. And I remember hearing him speak in Parliament. Um, and so you have this established church, which you think in some ways, he, everything that he stands against. And two people asked him questions. They said, well, what, what would you say to a politician? Um, how should they conduct themselves? And he just looked and said, don't lie. Uh, don't lie just tell the truth and that's one thing and then secondly you know someone asked him about what do you think about establishment and he said you know enjoy it while you've got it <laughs> in the sense of you know the, the influence which the influence of christianity that christianity has had and i mean i know that through your work and you know the importance of recognizing that even the things that i still think as a culture we hold dear uh, many of those things are there because of the influence of the gospel in our culture mm -hmm. and we f and 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 we forget that you can't have the fruit of a Christian worldview without the root of the Christian worldview. And I think that is still a, a powerful apologetic. I think it's diminishing, but we, I still think that's important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I mean, you know, what a, what a great practical thing to say to Christians, what we can do, don't lie, don't tell lie. the truth. Wow. Wow. And yeah. And, and let the chips fall where they may, even if you haven't yeah. got the 17 point plan of, for the, for the future. Yeah. What's, what's going to un unfold. Um, Jim Sayers has asked a great question about, you know, when we think about culture, surely ever more we're thinking about cultures. Yes, uh, of course, yeah. Fragmenting massively. Um, what, can, what can the church do in, in the, the light of, you know, Republicans hate Democrats and vice versa and Remainers hate Brexiteers and vice versa. Um, what, what, what can a Christian say that, that might be of some, some use when there isn't a culture out there? There are, there are many fractured cultures. Yes. So I, th I think part of it is, is um, a challenge and an encouragement the, the, the challenge is given that <laughs> in some ways every individual human person made in the image of God is unique and so represents in some ways a unique culture having said that um, to do any kind of teaching you have to generalize or else you know you could you could only talk about each individual person so we, we always have to generalize we don't we can't caricature or stereotype so that means firstly we need to listen carefully to where a, each individual person each individual community is coming from it means that we need to listen to understand how we hear and how we are heard and that takes kind of hard work listening is hard sometimes we're not very good at it um to know where to know where people are coming from having said that on the other hand we do believe that there are universal things about humanity that are true. And yes, they do have a kind of cultural um, specificity or they do have certain flavors. But again, th this idea of these magnetic points, this idea that no matter which culture you engage with, which person you're involved with, which religion, basically human beings, because they are made in God's image, they, they ask the same questions, they do the same things. So there's, there's on the one hand, and that gives us confidence that we don't need to have done a sociological degree in every on every person to be able to talk to them about Christ. Right. It means that it means we do need to listen and we do need to contextualize, but at the same time, there are certain givens that will always be there, and that gives us confidence. So do you see what I'm trying to say there? There's a kind of a it is a bit of a it is a both and and um there there are certain if culture partly is offering the world to people and say, look, this is my view of the world, enter in, of course there are certain views of the world that lots of people find popular. Um, and we need to understand what they are broadly at a very local level, but also the confidence to say, at the end of the day, human beings are human beings. They ask the same questions and we have answers to those questions. Well, Jesus, Jesus has answers to those questions. Yeah. And how do we contextualize that in the UK um, where class is such a, a huge issue? <laughs> yeah. You know, Love, yeah. Love Island has just had its, you know, finale. And, you know, in so many churches, that, well, what's, what's Love Island? Never heard of it. Um, uh, in, in other parts of the, the UK, that's, that's just massive. And, and 
why, why are we blind to those issues? How do, how do you speak across class boundaries here in the UK? Yeah, part, partly I think, and this is where the global church can help us because often one doesn't see your own cultural blind spots. And so we need the, the, um, the help and the counsel of those who are not part of our culture to help us with our cultural blind spots. So there's something about the global church, the unity of the church, not to be so isolated that we're only gonna, that we don't listen to other voices, firstly. Um, secondly, yeah, just to recognize for what it is. And you know, I think there are all kinds of issues to do with power. You know, there's been lots said about race and ethnicity and we need to do more work on that. And you know, that's not, not an issue in our context, but the whole class issue is, is because we're so in it, we just don't see it. It's so pervasive, especially in, in um, has been in evangelicalism. Um, and I think we need to do some serious work and to see what class is, how class works, what that means for power, realizing that, you know, um, me as a, me as a grammar school boy, you as an, you as an Aussie, how we're affected by that, how we might react against in a, in a, in a, in a unhelpful way as well. Um, so there's all kinds of kind of, you know, reacting to reacting against, but I think one of the key things is, is having the conversation, starting to talk about it more. And I, I, I hope, even though it's probably we've been forced to, it's probably helpful that at this time we're starting to talk about it more and what that might mean for the kind of the, the demographic of evangelicalism and how we might reach other parts of society that, that we haven't mm. um, uh, at, at a kind of a, yeah, at, at all kinds of levels. And, and to realize that, um, in some ways, Love Island is as religiously mo motivated as anything else that people do. Mm. Um, and yes, we need to work hard at, at, at doing that work. But um, I, yeah, I think it's, it's crucial. Mm. So you are, you are Director of Studies at Oak Hill. What's your, what's your title? Yeah, director. I'm a college director. Yeah. College director. And uh, you've been yeah. there, I guess, for like 12 years, something like that? 13? 14 years. 14 years. I I came during your last year as a student there. Ah, uh, yes, but you, I don't think I took your classes at that stage, so you can, you can disavow no. me, because, you know, plausible <laughs> deniability, you don't, you, don't, you don't have to claim me at all. Um, no, our, our one big interaction was um, you bowling an incredible leg spinner at a game outside the back of her. That sounds like outside. me. Yeah. It does. <laughs> Um, oh, I've, I've, I'm very pleased to be remembered in that in that way. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I bowled one or two in my time. Um, so you've seen, I guess, hundreds of people being prepared for ministry and, and sent out. Um, from, from your vantage point, um, what, what are some of the encouragements as, as we bring this interview to a close? What are some of the encouragements yeah. we can look to as we move forwards? I think there are there are lots of Christians, and as I go around the country and do, do some speaking events and do other stuff, there is a real hunger, I think, there's a hunger for people to make sense of what they think is going on. Mm. And I think there's a great opportunity for that to be fed with good, rigorous, orthodox Christian teaching and theology. That is, um, that isn't kind of, you know, um, soundbite or fast food. Uh, but is something that's substantial that is going to produce resilient those kind of men and women of Issachar who know the times and knew, and know what the church should be doing. Mm -hmm. So I do think there is there is a hunger out there, um, which I, I would say is a positive. And I would hope that what we're trying to produce at Oak Hill and other theological institutions are available um, is to is to recognise you know what does what does uh, what does the Bible require of a Christian leader and a minister? What does um, what do we need at this time? And I think the Bible can come up with, as we've done at Oak Hill, a kind of a graduate profile to say, these are, this is the character, these are the skills, this is the biblical wisdom that is needed of Christian ministry for this time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, would, I would hope that we are trying to do that and other places are trying to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's certainly a challenge. And I think just, just a wake up call, um, if you know realizing the hunger is i think for me a positive because i think now we're starting to realize that wow it is tough we are in a battle um you know maybe in, in the um in the language of kind of game of story, you know winter is coming mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and are we going to be ready and are we going to be are we going to be prepared um 
I use that. I've never watched Game of Thrones, but I hear that that is that was one of the things. So I can say that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> chapter four, yeah. you can discuss um, about whether whether Christians can and should. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. and just I think just to encourage inquisitiveness. And to uh, this big thing about realizing that our discipleship is not simply about what we do on a Sunday, what we do in our church during midweek. It, it's this whole holistic, whole life picture of, you know, are we keeping ourselves from idols in everything that we do, in the way that we educate our kids, in the way that the things that we watch or don't watch, in, our, in the way we construct, create culture, in the way that we are doing our own artistic endeavors. If we can have that mindset, then, then, then you know, the church... Is, you know, the church can be such an attractive home for people who feel dislocated and homeless. And that's, you know, that's what we need to be doing. Brilliant. And so final question, what, what, what do you hope that people will get out of Plugged In as they race out and buy a copy? Yeah. Well, my vision would be, and this may be kind of, you know, uh, idealistic, is I would love people in their churches to read the book and say, do you know what? Once a month or four times a year, we're going to get together and we're going to look at our own lives and say, let's look at the, the analysis of Plugged In. Let's look at the stages and how to do cultural analysis. And we're going to, in a group, we're going to have a discussion on a particular thing that's been troubling us or a thing we want to engage with or a, a conversation that we've had that didn't go well or what does this mean for my own life in, a, in my discipleship. I'd love, I'd love churches group christians to be getting together to discuss the book and i hope it's accessible enough for people to say or in, in your youth in youth groups or adult sunday schools or for preachers to be able to say you know yeah i'm in this sermon i'm going to be i'm going to be contextualizing my application in terms of this particular issue in, in culture so that would be some of my my kind of dreams for the book that people would read it but that it wouldn't just be an individual thing it would be let's do this together in community yeah yeah well i can testify that it has certainly helped me to do that to uh connect and confront and i just loved the uh, the worked examples at the back uh you've got some uh, some examples that students of yours have produced about how to connect and confront adult coloring books bird watching zombie films and the japanese domestic toilets and to discover more about that go and get the yeah, book go and read, go and read the you. book from the good book company highly recommended also tim keller highly recommends it so that's that's worth even more than my endorsement but uh I <laughs> Buy it by the box loads. Dan Strange, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.